there is. So we're going to be start looking at characteristic data for uh, cylinders. So we have uh, the DK and the AK, which is the diameter and the area on the piston side, so on this side of it, and on that side of the symbol. And then we have DST and AKR, which is used to signify the diameter and area on the other side where the piston rod is on a regular differential cylinder. cylinder. <coughs> and then we have uh, a ratio between the available surface area uh, surface areas for for the hydraulic pressure, which is basically just the ratio between the area on this side and the area on that side. So the one we looked at on Wednesday was uh, like this one. It was two to one. So it has twice as large area on this side than on that side. And this ratio, we find it by using the, the area on this side and just dividing it on the area on that side, straight off. And this, the area on the piston rod side, we get it by taking the full area and subtracting the area that the piston rod covers. <coughs> so the AST, we figure that one out from uh, doing the regular uh, pi multiplied with this diameter squared divided by four. So then we get, get the AST. But usually these values are given in, uh, in tables that, are, uh, that we can get from the manufacturers of the cylinders. This is just a small excerpt of, uh, of one of the tables given in the book. And we're just going to look at how they've built it up. So we have on the top, there are nominal values, values which is if we have a cylinder diameter of 25 or 32 or 40 millimeters, then we will have this corresponding area uh, to work with. So that is the full, the full uh, area on, on the piston side where, where we get the pressure working on the entire area. And then if our ratio is 1.25, so that we have 1.25 to one instead of two to one, as it says up there, then our piston rod, if our cylinder is 25 millimeters, our piston rod will be 12 millimeters in diameter. And this will correspond to, to this area, which gives us an actual ratio of 1.3 instead of 1.25. This has a bit to do with if we were going to get an exact 1.25 on this one, we would get a silly diameter there. So we would get uh, 11 point something. And uh, it's much easier to work with uh, uh, whole millimeters when we are setting dimensions, especially for finished products uh, that are going to be available, maybe even in stock in their warehouse so that they can just sell them directly. Uh, don't have to wait for it to be manufactured. Uh, so you can see as we move along here, some of these have exactly 1.25 and that's when it, uh, the, the, um, uh, the ratio actually corresponds between 40 and 18 so that you get a, get a uh, full millimeter uh, on, the, on the number there. And uh, for others, they are fairly close. So that if you usually, for all of these, if you round them off, you end up fairly close to 1.25 if you just look at it a bit simplistically. So they were very close there. But these are, uh, this is one thing we have to keep in mind that even though we are uh, basing ourselves on using a 1.21 to one ratio cylinder, the actual value might be slightly different than what it says there. So that's why it's important to actually go into the data from the manufacturer and get, get the exact values there. Then we're going to start looking at resistance to buckling for the cylinders. So we have uh, been dimensioning, uh, in order to dimension a piston rod diameter and stroke length, we need to know uh, about resistance to buckling. Resistance to buckling according to Euler. 
we have to take that into account when we're looking at it. And this is the stuff that we uh, that you learned in uh, statics and strength of materials. And I think you're going to uh, learn about it in uh, mechanical design or pipe construction. I can't quite remember. I didn't do those exact courses. I did other courses that were merged together and became these courses. So. <coughs> Uh, we have a free buckling length, which is an, that's not a capital I, that's an L, LK. And this LK, it depends on what kind of load case we have. And then we have a permissible buckling force, which is basically the force we can permit the, uh, the rod, piston rod and cylinder to, to, uh, uh, the force we can permit them to be uh, be uh, loaded with uh, in order to avoid them buckling, basically. So this is how we calculate this. Uh, you probably used in uh, statics and strength of materials, you probably ju just used F there. You didn't have a K permissible. That depends very on what kind of uh, textbook you're working from. Uh, another textbook will probably have a different way of describing this one. But we just need to remember that this is the force, the load that we are putting on our system. And this one should be fairly familiar to you. We have the, uh, yeah, we have the uh, elasticity, the modulus of elasticity or Young's modulus as it's all also called. And usually when we're talking about a hydraulic cylinder, it is made out of steel or stainless steel. So the uh, E modulus is 210 gigapascals, not megapascals as we are used to working with, but gigapascals. The I, capital I, that's the area moment uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the rod. And the uh, LK is the free buckling length. And the velocity, no, not the velocity, the, um, it's a bit silly that the book is using this uh, Greek letter mu, as it, it is also the, 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 letter, the Greek letter that we use for, for viscosity, kinematic viscosity. Uh, but they've chosen, in the book, they've chosen to use this one for safety factor. Uh, I'm more used to it being, let's just get a pen here. I'm more used to it being either a gamma or just straight up SF for safety factor. So um, exactly why they are using this one, I don't really know, but um, they've chosen to do that. But it is the safety factor. So it is uh, something that we are going to multiply into our equation in order to get, uh, get a lower force that is permissible. So if we didn't have the safety factor in here, we would have uh, get a higher permissible force, which would mean that we would be much closer to actually making the cylinder buckle under use. So instead we put in this safety factor, which is going to lower this force by uh, somewhere between two and a half and three and a half, a factor of that, just so that we uh, know that we are on the safe side. So even though we, put on the full load we have here, we're not going to make this accidentally buckle because it still has quite a lot of strength left uh, due to this safety factor. So the length L, not this LK one, but length L, it is calculated between the fixed bearing uh, points on the cylinder. So basically if you have one of these that can pivot in both ends, it's between the centers of those bearings. If you have a, a flange in one end, it would be from the end of the flange and to, to the other end of the cylinder. So it's, uh, it's uh, wherever the cylinder is mounted, that is, uh, is the buckling length between those two mounting points. So here we have the uh, cases, load cases for buckling. If we have one end free and one end securely clamped, so if we have the lower section is bolted into place by a flange, 
and then we have nothing up top. It just goes straight up uh, with no guidance or anything like that. Then we have this case where if it starts buckling, it's going to buckle from the top here and go over to the side so that you get the, this sway motion uh, in the piston rod and cylinder. And our LK then will be two times the length of the cylinder. So it will be twice as long as the length of the cylinder because the cylinder will be this length, uh, this length that goes all the way up here uh, when it's fully extended, of course. Uh, and then our buckling length will be twice that. Case two, which is the most usual one, is that we have both ends of the cylinder hinged so that we have like the one we saw on the previous slide, we have hinge points on, on both ends of the cylinder. And this gives us a free buckling length of the same length as the cylinder, basically. And here you can see that it will be swaying like this instead. Then we have case three, which is one end hinged and one end securely clamped, so basically this option combined with this option. And here you can see in both of these, uh, we have something guiding uh, our load also, so that it can't really just fall over to one side, like it can in, in this case. Uh, but here we get, as you can see, this curve is just uh, re really nice. It's, uh, it w would end up it will have one radius and it will end up being a circle if you, if you complete the curve. But on this one, you have this swaying motion here because down here, it's completely fixed. It can't sway out here. So it has to go straight up for a little while and then it starts curving like this. So you're putting a lot of strain on, on the material uh, in that case. And here you get the length of the cylinder multiplied with the square root of a half, uh, one half. So it's, uh, uh, you get a pretty short LK uh, on this one. And then the last case is if you have securely clamped both ends of the, of the cylinder. Then you, you, have, uh, you get this same uh, problem, but now you get it in both ends of, uh, of the cylinder. So then you multiply the length with one half. So you get half the length of the cylinder as the buckling length. <clears throat> Usually, didn't I have that one in there? Okay, uh, I've, I've lost one of the animations I put in here, but uh, it is supposed to be that case three and case four we don't normally use. That would be a really, really special case for, for uh, putting up a cylinder like this. This is the basic case, and this is what we usually go for. We try to get it hinged in both ends just to get this this uh, very easy to, uh, to calculate buckling length and uh, very little strain on, on the material itself so that you get, get a very, very nice uh, low, uh, we get a very nice load case. This one also works uh, well and is used in some situations, but they are a bit more specialized in that situation. And if you find yourself in a design situation where this seems like the only option, then I would really, really recommend trying to get more people in on it and, and try to brainstorm a different solution so that you can move away from, from that solution because it's, it's not a good choice and it's going to, to be, uh, make it a bit more difficult because you're going to uh, incre have to increase the dimension of your cylinder much more than if you were able to use this case. So, and then the summary, uh, we looked at double acting cylinders and how they worked. We became familiar with many different types of double acting cylinders. We learned about end position cushioning and how you can uh, avoid these jerks at the, uh, when uh, the cylinder stops moving. We have looked at different types of seals and different types of mounting options for, for the cylinders. And we've looked that the need for bleeding of air in the hydraulic system to avoid, uh, avoid uh, bubbles of air being compressed inside the high pressure system. And we've looked at different characteristic data and we've looked at how to 
dimension a cylinder with regards to resistance uh, against buckling. And there we have the references for this one. Then we'll go over to the one we were supposed to start with today. So today's learning goals then is to know how to select a cylinder for a specific task and become familiar with hydraulic motors and know how to select a hydraulic motor for a specific task. This has a little bit to do with, uh, with the lab uh, assignment that you're going to do. In the lab assignment, you're not going to select the hydraulic motor, uh, but I'm going to, uh, the, the schematics that I'm pulling up are similar to the ones that you will be looking at for deciding, uh, deciding stuff in your lab assignment, so that uh, it's, uh, it will be relevant towards the lab assignment, this one. So we're going to become familiar with the characteristic values of valves. And you're going to know what actuating force is. And actuating force happens inside a valve. So we're, uh, we're starting to move past the, uh, the large components of cylinders and motors and pumps now. And we're go moving into the smaller components of valves. And we're going to start learning how, how they work. So we're going to become familiar with different design principles on, val on valves, and we're going to know how a poppet valve works, which is one type of valve, and we're also going to know how a slide valve works. So we'll start off by selecting a cylinder, and we're going to do an example from, uh, from the book. And it's this one where we are going to we're going to select an appropriate cylinder for lifting uh, this. It's a, a conveyor belt moving some crates, and we need to move the crates from one altitude to another, so from one elevation to another. Uh, it's a bit of a silly design. I would have uh, <laughs> I would have recommended just inclining the entire conveyor belt. That would have been a <laughs> an easier way of doing this, but. Uh, it might be that this is very slippery, so that if you incline it, they're going to slip off the uh, conveyor belt or something. So you need this cylinder in order to, uh, to push it up. So we're going to need a differential, uh, we're going to use a differential cylinder with a piston diameter of 63 millimeters and a surface area ratio of two to one, which means that it's going to have twice as much force when it's pushing upwards and twice as much, much speed when it's uh, moving back down. So it's going to move quickly down and uh, push hard up. And here we have, uh, have the uh, table that we looked at on Wednesday with a two to one cylinder shown exactly in it. So we'll just keep those up there. And we need to lift a load of 40 kilonewtons and uh, it's going to be lifted 500 millimeters in five seconds. So we're going to look at if, if this, uh, this cylinder is going to be able to do that. And in order to, to check what piston rod diameter we need, we need to look at table 5.5, which is the one that we uh, looked at in the previous lecture now, a, a bit earlier. Now, instead of looking at the 1.2 section, we're looking at the uh, 2 to 1 section. Now, uh, we looked at 1.25 section earlier. Uh, now we're looking at the 2 to 1 section. And I've also just isolated the, the uh, proper cylinder diameter for it. Basically, because I didn't have room to put the entire thing in here, <laughs> or else I would have shown it a bit better. But you will fi find all of this on your... Uh, Page 82, you have the entire, entire table. <coughs> and we can see that we, we have a cylinder that is, has a diameter of 63 millimeters. And with a 2 to 1 uh, surface area ratio, our piston rod is 45 millimeters. So this means that we have... 45 millimeters as the piston rod diameter. And what will be the maximum stroke length uh, in our case then? 
then we have to look at this one, which is on page 85. <coughs> and here we have uh, length in millimeter. So this is the stroke length that is given in the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have force in newtons. So we had a load of 40 kilonewtons. That puts us up here, 40 kilonewtons. And then we go over to the 45 millimeter piston rod. And then we go down here and we see that the maximum stroke length is 1,000, 1,100, 1,200, 1,300, 1,400 something. And then if we start counting all of the small lines here, we get 1,440 no, 1, millimeters of the maximum stroke length. And that is more than enough. We needed 500 millimeters. So our, our uh, cylinder is going to be able to lift this even further than what it, what it needs to. So if we chose a different surface area ratio for this one, we could, uh, we could select a piston rod with a smaller diameter. So I, uh, I forgot to mention here on this one, uh, this will be the maximum stroke length that we're looking at. So maximum stroke length. It do doesn't mean that our particular cylinder has to lift it uh, 1.4 meters in the air. Uh, we will still design our cylinder to have a stroke length of 500 millimeters. But if we looked into this, uh, this table and say we had uh, 12 as the diameter and we had 3,000 uh, newtons as the load, then we would get over here, down here, and we don't even have 500 as the maximum length. So then we couldn't use that, uh, uh, that cylinder. So the point here uh, with checking uh, this one is to see that we, uh, we are actually able to have uh, 500 millimeters as a stroke length. It is within our range. <coughs> because if we get past this one, then we have broken the safety, uh, uh, safety factor in our buckling resistance uh, calculation. So that's why they, what they have plotted in here, the, the red curves, is for the different diameters of piston rods. and where they are going to be with regards to resistance against buckling with different lengths and different, uh, different forces. So as you can see, usually when you're selecting stuff like this uh, for, for design, um, there isn't always that you have to actually do that much math yourself. It is often served to you as a table and you have to know how to read it from, from the table instead. But it would always be nice to actually be able to do, do uh, backup calculations, just, just to check that, that what, what you've read from the table is actually going to, uh, to be correct. So that doing the buck buckling calculation with, uh, with that amount of force and, and length that you put in there and seeing that this fits in with, uh, with the maximum length, that would have been, been a nice just backup to, to see that, that you've done the, the correct assumptions. So based on the geometric values that we've been given uh, in the start here and the forces, uh, the cylinder that has been chosen is suitable for this task. Uh, we can design it to have 500 millimeters uh, in load. But there is one thing that I'm missing in this task, and it, it says nothing about the five seconds. Because that would have been uh, something that we would need to, to calculate, because there we would actually put in uh, our flow rate. So we would have to look at what flow rate would we need in order to fill this area uh, quickly enough so that it will be completely filled, all of the volume on the pressure side of the piston, fill it, uh, fill it up within five seconds. So that was something that I, uh, I missed a bit here. Uh, um, but for some reason, they have decided not to, uh, to put it in the example. Yeah, we don't have time for that. <laughs> you have to read it in your book. It's very well explained in the book also, so I'm just going through it basically. Uh, and this is going to be online, so you can 
here at all uh, in a while. So that's just a, a quick note on that. Uh, some something had happened in uh, uh, with uh, some of the uh, lectures, so there was no basically no sound on them. The sound volume was really really low. So even though you turned it up to maximum, you could hear my voice, but you couldn't hear what I was saying. So I've been uh, working at uploading those, but it takes a little bit of a time, but uh, hopefully by next weekend, I'll be back on track with uh, keeping up with, with uh, this, uh, the week's uh, lectures. So I'm a bit behind now, but hopefully by next week, I'll be getting everything up in time. So hydraulic motors, they convert hydraulic energy into mechanical energy and they cause rotating motion. And if the rotating motion is confined to a certain uh, range of angle, uh, so that it's not allowed to rotate all the way around and just keep on rotating, uh, it's going to rotate, for an example, 90 degrees, and then go back again, and then go 90 degrees. <clears throat> then it's an oscillating motor, because then it's just going back and forth between, between two angles. It has the same design principle as pumps. So we looked at the gear pumps and the uh, piston rod pumps and all of these. They will be designed in exactly the same way. The only thing is that instead of having an electric motor running the axle so that you are rotating the equipment inside, uh, the components inside the pump and forcing the fluid to flow through it, you are instead forcing the fluid to flow past the components and making them rotate so that your axle is rotating. So basically you're doing the reverse of a pump when you're running a hydraulic motor. And with that said, uh, quite a lot of uh, hydraulic motors can actually in a pinch be run as pumps so that you can just uh, connect the shaft to a motor and start running it and it will act as a pump. So if you're in a real pinch out uh, offshore on a boat or something, you have a couple of hydraulic pumps lying around and you need a motor, you can quickly rebuild the pumps to, uh, to act as motors and vice versa. If you have a pump that's completely uh, destroyed, then you can replace it with a motor that you just rebuild slightly by, by putting it, uh, ma making it fit into your already existing system. So we have the fixed displacement motors, just like we have the fixed displacement pumps. That's a constant displacement volume, so you can't adjust it. And then we have adjustable motors where you can actually adjust the amount of volume that you are uh, moving for each rotation. And we get the same kind of, uh, kind of tree for the motors as we did for the, for the pumps. The only thing is, if you actually uh, compare these two trees, you will see that a few of the options are missing from hydraulic motors. Um, I think they actually exist as hydraulic motors, but they are just not that good. Uh, in they don't have that uh, good of an efficiency ratio as, uh, as the rest have. So we have the geared motors down here. We have vane motors and piston motors. So the same basic principles as for the pumps. And we also get the same characteristic values as the pumps, only going the other way around, of course. And the volumetric flow rate required is calculated uh, out of what kind of speed we want to get from it and also what displacement volume is available in the motor. So if it is one with an adjustable placement, displacement volume, you can actually adjust it to to the correct speed uh, without uh, doing much to the flow rate. So you can keep the flow rate constant and then you can adjust the displacement volume uh, on the motor. If it is a constant displacement volume motor, then you have to regulate the speed by regulating the volumetric flow rate. <coughs> so in order to get uh, pressure when we are calculating motors, uh, we are going to need the momentum that the motor can deliver and the displacement volume. And the same goes for the, the volumetric flow rate and we of course need the, the speed, uh, rotating speed and the displacement volume. So these are the basic, uh, basic um, 
uh, equations that we use when we are calculating motors. So if you know what, uh, what momentum you need, what torque you need the, uh, uh, your motor to deliver, and you know what displacement volume it is, say it's, an, uh, it's a constant displacement volume uh, motor, so then you have a fixed, fixed number there and you know what you need up here, then you can very quickly calculate what pressure you, you're going to have to deliver to the motor in order to gain this. And the same with the rotational speed, if you know the displacement volume uh, and you know what speed you need to have, for an example, if uh, this hydraulic motor is going to run a subsea uh, circular saw or something, you um, are going to need uh, a certain cutting speed on this blade, which means that it's going to need to rotate at a certain velocity. And then you look at the displacement volume of the motor you have available, you look at the speed that you need, and then you can calculate what flow rate you're going to have to deliver from your pump into the motor. So we're going to do a couple of example calculations on hydraulic motors. Just going to get the text here so I remember everything. So we have a hydraulic motor with 12.9 cubic centimeters of uh, displacement volume. And usually the displacement volume is given in cubic centimeters. So almost always when we're doing calculations like this, we're going to have to convert units afterwards. And we have a flow rate of 15 cub uh, cubic decimeters per minute. And a one cubic decimeter is the same as one liter. So we know that we have 15 liters per minute in this case. And we have a torque of one newton meter. And we're going to figure out what the speed and specified power is in this one. So we know the flow rate and we know the volume. And we're going to figure out the rotation speed of it. So we just flip around this uh, equation to get n equals q divided by v. When we put in our values here, we get 15 liters per minute up top and 12.9 uh, centimeter, uh, cubic centimeters basically, but if we convert it to cubic decimeters, it's a bit easier to, to do this calculation. And then we get 1,163 RPMs. And we're also going to figure out what the specified power is for this, uh, this motor, so basically the, the power output of the motor. And if we go into the mechanical and metal trades handbook that we use in uh, mechanical design, the small blue book, we can figure out uh, just by looking at power output in the registry of the book, then you can figure out what page you are going to get your power equations on. And you'll find this equation and you'll also find this one so that you can convert it. This is the uh, rotational veloc angle velocity. I can't remember what it's called in English. Um, <laughs> but this is, is uh, omega, which is connected to the rotational velocity of it. Uh, so we use 2 times pi to get a full circle, to get the, all of the degrees of a circle. Uh, multiply it with the uh, rot rotational velocity and multiply it with the torque that we have. So we have 2 pi, we put in the velocity we calculated and we put in the torque that we had given. So <coughs> uh, the velocity is given per minute, rotations per minute, RPM. Uh, but for power output, we usually want it in watts, which is newton meters per second. So then it is nice to just divide it by 60 seconds, because then you're going to get it, instead of getting it in newton meters per minute, you're getting it in newton meters per second, so that you can get it directly out as watts. 
So we have a hydraulic motor of 122 watts. <coughs> the second thing that we're going to calculate is the output torque if we run it at 140 bars. So then we're going to use this equation. We're going to uh, turn it around to figure out what the output torque is, because now we've said that our pressure is 140 bars, which in this case is the maximum operating pressure in the system. We already know the, the displacement volume. So we put this in. We have uh, 140 bars, that's 14 megapascals, or 140 times 10 to the fifth pascals, if you do it directly from, from bar to pa pascal. I always find it easier to do 10 bars into one megapascal, because then I just do it directly in my head instead of having to think too much. Uh, and then I have a volume of, uh, the displacement volume put in there, uh, of course, and then we get 14 Newton per square meter, uh, and we get uh, 12.9 square meters there, because we have, we have 10 to the sixth pascals, and we have 10 to the minus sixth uh, cubic meters. So if we, if we run a cubic centimeter up to a cubic meter, then it became, becomes 10 to the minus sixth. So we get 180, approximately, Newton meters in output instead. So in this original one, the pressure is probably pretty low since we only have, have uh, one Newton meter of torque. And then when we run it up to the maximum pressure of the system, we get quite a lot of torque fr from this uh, motor. We'll do a break for 15 minutes, then we'll start looking at this one, which is relevant to uh, parts of the lab assignment that you're going to do later on with Lunal or someone else, I'm not quite sure.
Okay, so you won't find this one in your book. This is one I've gotten from, uh, from a web page or, or basically a catalog from, uh, from a uh, manufacturer of hydraulic motors, which is uh, Sewer Danfoss, which is a, a I think they were originally one German company and one Danish company, but they've merged and uh, become one international company, basically. Uh, and this is for one of their uh, engines, one of the motors, uh, with 125 cubic centimeter volume, I think it is. That's why it's named 125. <coughs> and we're just going to look a bit at, at this uh, whole chart uh, to see how we're going to figure out stuff from it. Because as you can see, there's quite a lot of information in here. We have the rotational speed on the x-axis given in RPMs. And we have the torque given in Newton meters going vertically there. But also we have loads of different lines going around in here. So we have these thin lines that are uh, more or less horizontal or just curving slightly upwards. They are uh, giving different pressures. Then we have these lines that go downwards here, like this one. They are giving flow rates, specific flow rates. And then we also have these uh, sort of curves inside there, and they give different efficiencies for them. So if we look at the curve that is approximately here, it's a bit difficult to draw on for f with a, a free hand uh, around here, but basically following this curve, everything within it is at an efficiency of at least 80%. So if you can, can stay somewhere in, inside this red, red ring, then you are going to, to have at least 80% efficiency on your motor, which means that you would have to, you would have, to have uh, a rotational speed that's between 25 there and uh, 350 RPMs uh, for this one. And then you also have to have a certain torque being delivered in order to, to get, get within there, and you also have to have a certain flow rate in order to get, get in that area. So we'll look at, for an example, if we have a flow rate that varies between 30 and 40 liters per minute. So we, we can adjust the flow rate of our system, and we, we, can, uh, we have the possibility of adjusting it between 30 and 40, and we wish to achieve 80% efficiency. That means that we have to stay within the blue area here, because along this line we have 30 liters per minute, and along this line, we have 40 liters per minute. So anything between those two and within the 80% area, that's going to be, uh, be uh, something where we can deliver what we need. And also, we have a pressure of uh, between 60 and 80 bars uh, in our system. So we can regulate the pressure between 60 and 80 bars. So then we follow the 60 bar line up here, and we can also follow the uh, 80 bar line up here. That puts, uh, puts us up in this region. And that means that we have to have a torque somewhere between 120 and 220 Newton meters, approximately. And we need a rotational speed between 230 and 320 uh, RPMs. <coughs> so this means that basically th that's what we have to work with. If if we are going to, to run a, a circular saw, for an example, and we know that we need, uh, in order to achieve the correct cutting speed on, on the saw blade, we need uh, 275 RPMs, then we are within it in this area. And then we can also check by going to 275, going up here. Then we can also see that, well, 120 Newton meters, that's going to be too little. We're not going to be able to... to to run the saw if we only are getting that torque from it. So we are going to have to boost it a little bit. So our pressure has to come a bit up. And then we get into a bit higher uh, torque output uh, from it. So these are the ways that you often decide which uh, hydraulic motor you're going to use. And in my experience, the first couple of times that you're going to decide something like this, you are going to go back and forth and back and forth because there are hundreds of different types of motors, and you're going to try to find the one that fits you perfectly. 
And then you found one that you're very pleased with here and with the characteristic values. It's very good there, but then you go, uh, you flip a few pages in the catalog and then you figure out that, damn it, the external dimensions of this one means that it's not going to fit inside uh, whatever uh, equipment it is that I'm creating. So then I have to go back and I have to try to find a uh, hydraulic motors that, that is smaller but can still deliver the same uh, same uh, uh, characteristic values that I'm looking for. And then you have to try to find another type of motor and you have to uh, look at that one. So it's a, it's a lot of back and forth when, when you're trying to, to select something like this. And in, uh, in the lab report, we have one hydraulic motor and it is a Danfoss uh, motor. Uh, so a part of your assignment is that you will be getting a graph like this uh, and I'm not quite sure what it is you're supposed to do, but you're going to read some values from it. And then I think you are supposed to verify them by measuring, for an example, the rotational speed. So at a given, at a given pressure and a given uh, volumetric rate, uh, you're going to set the system for that and you're going to run the motor and then you're going to, uh, to measure the rotational speed with an instrument. And then see if you end up approximately where you thought you were going to end up. Uh, in uh, in this chart. <coughs> uh, just to relate something to a hydraulic motor used subsea, one of the uh, main problems that you're going to get there is the fact that the hydraulic motor is dependent on having leakage oil. It needs to have leakage oil in order to lubricate itself for the rotating motion. And this leaking oil, uh, leakage oil usually leaks into a compartment that is around the shaft. So it ends up being between the shaft and the seal against the outside environment. The problem then is that the leakage oil is not going to be under pressure. So the leakage oil is going to be uh, basically just uh, atmospheric pressure more or less. So <coughs> When you are going to run the system, uh, if you're going to lower it down to 300 meters depth or 3,000 meters depth for that matter, this compartment in here where the uh, leakage oil is supposed to gather up and return to tank, it's the whole ceiling part here is just going to collapse inwards by the pressure coming from the outside. So the hydrostatic water pressure that is around the motor is just going to force the entire ceiling in there and it's going to, going to create a lot of leakage and uh, water is going to get into, into your hydraulic motor and it's going to really mess things up. So, <coughs> uh, one of the ways of doing this is that on the return line, so the, the, the single line where the leakage oil is going from the hydraulic motor and back to the tank, you can have one of these compressors on that, uh, not com compressors, but a compensator on that one. So we, we've talked about the compensators before where one end of a piston basically is open to the hydrostatic pressure of the ocean. So it's going to create, uh, going to create pressure inside uh, the leakage compartment so that you end up getting the same base pressure in your entire system. So that is one, one of the things that you have to, uh, uh, have to keep in mind uh, that uh, the leakage oil part is going to create some troubles when you are, when you are going to use a hydraulic motor subsea. And to my knowledge, there aren't any uh, hydraulic motors that are being specifically made for subsea use. So, so no one has actually created uh, a particular design that counteracts this. So you have to sort of think this way that you have to adapt something that is used on land and you have to adapt it to be used uh, below water. <coughs> that was just a, a quick... Uh, quick tie into to the subsea technology part. <coughs> then we're going to start looking at hydraulic valves and how they work. And hydraulic energy is transferred from our pump and to the consumers in our system, usually through hydraulic lines, whether they are pipes or tubes or hosings, something. Uh, there is something that is transferring uh, connecting the pump to the different consumers in, in the system, whether they be cylinders or hydraulic motors or something else. But if we just connect everything, 
how can we control it? We can't control it if we just keep it everything connected and we're going to get full pressure everywhere. That's not going to work. So we're going to need valves. And we use them to control the torque, for an example, uh, either the force on a cylinder or the torque on a hydraulic motor, uh, the uh, stroke speed of a cylinder or the rotational speed of a, uh, a um, hydraulic motor. Also the direction of motion, so whether the uh, hydraulic motor is going to spin clockwise or counterclockwise, or if the cylinder is going to be extending or retracting the piston rod. And we use it to control specified operating conditions, so that if we need a specific pressure at a specific moment, then we are going to use valves to, to create this condition for us. So we use them to control mostly anything inside the system. The valves also add some resistance to the system, so you are going to have a slight pressure drop uh, uh, when you're going through a valve. And they are classified based on functions, exactly what it is that they do, and the design of how, how they are designed and how they uh, perform their functions, and the actuation type. So we're going to look a bit more into the actuation force a bit later on. And depending on the uh, functions that they are to perform, we use them as pressure regulators, so that if, if we need to restrict pressure in our system, maybe we have a pump that when it's running optimally, it delivers 200 bars, but maybe we have some component in our system that can only handle 180 bars. So then we're going to need a pressure regulator that uh, sort of uh, releases this extra amount of pressure into the tank so that we don't, we don't get more than 180. And directional control valves, which is what we use basically to, to control uh, the direction of motion of, uh, of the components that we are running. And also shut off valves in order to just completely shut down the flow. And flow control valves, which is what we use to control the speed, uh, whether it's rotational or stroke speed. The pressure regulators will, of course, uh, control the, the force or torque of the components. And when we're looking at characteristic values of valves, we usually talk about a nominal size. And then we have different kinds of diameters uh, that is given uh, as nominal, nominal sizes, nominal pressures which is the operating pressure in bars usually, and that we have uh, our entire system has been designed to, to work under this pressure. And a nominal flow rate, which is the quantity of fluid that we need uh, to deliver through our system. And that is calculated with a pressure drop of one bar across the valve, and that is if we have a kinematic viscosity of 35 square millimeters per second at 40 degrees Celsius. So this is something that changes a bit depending on the operating conditions of our system. <coughs> and we also have a maximum flow rate, so which is the largest quantity of hydraulic fluid uh, that can flow through the valve. And then we are going to get a pressure drop, drop that is quite a lot larger than one bar. We usually have a viscosity range to look at. So anything from 20 to 230 uh, in viscosity. A temperature range, of course. So 10 to 80 degrees is the usual one that we use because that's usually where we want our hydraulic fluid to be. And then we're going to start looking at the actuating force. And the actuating force means that what we actually need to do, the force we need to apply to the valve in order to make it uh, switch functions. So usually, uh, in a system like this, if we have uh, the flow 
hitting straight on to, to the uh, piston part of the valve. The flow is going this way over here. Um, but now, if we're going to close off this valve, we're going to have to counteract all of the force. So if we have 200 bars in here, we're getting 200 bars divided uh, or multiplied with this square area. So we're getting quite a lot of force that we need to, need to push on. So basically, if you, if, you were, uh, if you had this valve in front of you and you had a handle that you were going to push down in order to get it, it would be really hard to make it, uh, make it close. <coughs> yeah, so the force needed to close the valve. Um, and that is the result, basically, of the direct pressure we have there. And the higher pressure we have, of course, then the higher power, uh, the more force we are going to have to use in order to be able to close the valve. So people have figured out different ways of, uh, of doing this, uh, of increasing the force that we can put on the valve. One of the ways is to use mechanical leverage. Basically, if you have a handle that you are pushing down, make the handle longer so that you get the longer uh, lever arm. That will give you more force when you are doing it, uh, trying to close it. Or you can use piloting, which is basically just allowing some of the pressure access to the backside of the piston. Because this means that uh, the pressure you're getting here uh, working on the surface area that you have there is going to counteract most of the pressure that you have on this side. So this means that you have, you have basically removed uh, all of the pressure affecting the area outside the piston rod on this one. So now the only thing left on this side is the pressure uh, multiplied with the area of the piston rod only. So suddenly you're not, you're not working against the area of the entire piston, but only of the piston rod. Which means that you ha can, depending on how, how thin or thick your piston rod is, you can uh, get quite a lot of, uh, of effect out of this one. So you can reduce the force uh, by much doing this. <coughs> and the hydraulic fluid uh, flows around the control edges, so you just jump back a bit here. So th this is going to be the control edge of it, so that when you push the piston down, it is going to, once this part of the piston reaches these edges, it is completely shut. Then, then you have closed it off completely. So that when, <coughs> are there are actually not going to get all the way down because uh, the diameter here is a bit smaller than the diameter up here, so that it's going to hit somewhere up here, approximately, and then you're going to get uh, a fully closed uh, valve. But the, the uh, control edge, as they call it, is the edge around where we are closing it. And since we have quite a lot of flow passing through here, it has this self-cleaning effect, so that if any contamination particles are in the fluid, they're not going to get stuck on this control edge and, and make sure that the, the valve can't close properly. So that they're not, they're not going to, to block, block uh, the valve from getting, getting completely into contact with that edge because the fluid flow is moving it away constantly. Uh, which means that, that they are relatively insensitive to contamination. And the, the minor side is that if, if somehow a contamination particle gets stuck, then you are, of course, not going to be able to close uh, the valve properly. So you're going to leave a very small gap open, which means that you can risk getting cavitation there. So over time, with, uh, uh, with large uh, pressures and flow rates, you, you might risk having cavitation in it. Most likely, if a contamination particle gets stuck there and you're trying to close it down, uh, the next time you open it up, this contamination particle is going to be, be washed away so that uh, when, for the second time when you try to close it, it's, it's going to be fully closed again. So the, uh, it's, uh, it's not a huge problem, uh, but it is something that can happen every now and then. 
So here we have an illustration of this piston. And we have friction forces between the housing of the valve, which is uh, on the outside here, and uh, the piston itself. And if, if we would just allow the piston to, uh, to uh, be directly into contact with, with the walls of the, uh, of the housing, then we would have quite a lot of uh, friction uh, to work against. So that would add to how much force we would need in order to close the valve. So in order to work against this a bit and uh, sort of uh, try to use the hydraulic fluid uh, as an assistant in this case, they've actually created uh, these grooves that go around the ring because they trap some hydraulic fluid inside them. And as you start pushing on the piston, some of this hydraulic fluid is going to escape along the edges so that you get a thin film of hydraulic fluid along the piston. And that means that instead of having friction uh, of steel against steel uh, in the valve, you are getting the friction of a thin layer of fluid instead. So you're just getting the viscous friction inside the fluid, which means that it is uh, almost uh, like having no friction at all between them. Yeah, considerably lower uh, friction in that case. Now we're going to look at a couple of different designs for valves. So we have the one that's called a poppet valve, which is the one that we have been looking at, where you have this piston, which are moving up and down, and you are closing off the flow by, by basically just blocking the opening completely. There are many different designs on this one, and we're going to look in, uh, in at uh, different, different designs uh, a bit later on. But then the other main uh, main design we have are the sliding valves. So there you have, instead of having uh, a motion that directly counteracts the flow, so that you, you have to push directly against the motion on, on the poppet valve, uh, your, your motion of translation on the piston goes directly against the flow so that you get full pressure on, on what you're uh, moving against. The slide valve goes at a 90 degree angle uh, compared to the flow. So that here you have flow coming in here, it pushes on the piston, but that doesn't really affect it much because you are going to just slide it back and forth instead. So in, on, on the slide valves, you, you usually uh, can get away with quite a lot lower uh, actuation force because you're just sliding it back and forth. And here you also have these grooves which cause uh, hydraulic film around the pistons so that they are uh, easier to slide back and forth. <coughs> and also there is something called overlap and control edge geometry. So we've all already talked about the control edge, which is the edge that we are, are uh, blocking against. In a slide valve, it would be, in this case, keeping, keeping the piston uh, uh, across this edge here and that edge there, and the same on these sides. If we pull the piston this way until this side of the piston comes clear of the edge here, then we are going to have full flow back here, full flow up in the middle. <coughs> so overlap is like in, in this case where the piston is actually covering further. It's, it's not just stopping at the control edge, but it's actually moving past the, con uh, past the uh, control edge so that we are covering more area. <coughs> and for poppet valves, we have balls, cones, or discs, which are the usual geometries that are used in order to, to press against this control edge seat, as it's called. So then we have the ball poppet valve. We've looked at these uh, before. Uh, we've called them non-return valves. And that is the usage that they are, are meant for. They are easy to manufacture. Uh, one problem is that the balls tend to vibrate so that if you have a, 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 f a high flow going through it, it's going to create some noise because you have vibration going on inside the valve. So, so you can actually hear them uh, when you're using them. So whenever, <coughs> like in this case, if we 
put hydraulic fluid flow in here, it's going to push the, uh, the ball into the spring, compressing the spring, and the flow is going to escape to the sides. And the fact that the flow is passing uh, on the sides of the ball, and the ball is just basically resting on the spring, it's going to make the, the ball uh, just shake around a bit, and that is going to translate through the spring and then into the housing of the valve, so, so that you get uh, vibrations in of the housing itself, and then you can actually feel it if you have uh, flow passing uh, passing through it. So if you actually put your fingers on top of the uh, the valve, you are going to actually feel these vibrations uh, that it's uh, doing that. Then, if it gets bad enough, you can actually hear them too. So. But they are used as non-return valves because they will only open up if we have flow coming from this side. So any flow coming this way or that way is going to keep the ball closed. So, so that's going to just add more pressure to the ball and keeping it closed against, against the control edge seat there. So it's only when we get flow from this side that this one opens. So it's very useful in order to have flow going one way but not coming back. <coughs> then we have bevels or seat valves. They are used uh, quite a lot in, uh, in the car industry for valves on, uh, on engines. So the valves they use to let uh, uh, fuel and uh, air into the combustion chamber and also let the exhaust out of the combustion chamber. They are often seat valves. <coughs> and they need very high precision uh, when they are uh, making those, but the upside is that they have very good sealing uh, capabilities. So they can, keep, uh, they can keep very tight w when they are in use. So, so it's a very low chance of having any leakage. And that is also why they use them in, in uh, car engines uh, to, to direct their flows. And that is what they are used for. They are used for directing flow. So it's going to open up when we have uh, uh, flow coming this way. And it's going to keep closed when we have flow coming this way. In this case, where we have... Uh, have it uh, operated by, by a spring. On a, on a car engine, it's a bit different because uh, on a car engine, it has the spring, but it also has a piston rod that is connected to a camshaft. So one of these... Um, where you have a circular axle, but you have these egg-shaped parts of it. So that as this one rotates, this point is going to push on, on these uh, piston rods in a car engine. And then the piston rod is going to open up the, the, uh, the valve. So then it's going to let the exhaust out or the air and fuel in. <coughs> so they are both operated by springs and, and piston rods. Then we have the disc puppet valves. And... Uh, one of the good things with those is that they have a very small stroke range, so they practically don't have, this is a very oversized view of how it is, so most likely you would need to have a spring that was just basically cut off there. So you, you don't really need much motion in order to, uh, to uh, let quite a lot of flow past it. And it's often used for, for shut-off valves to, to uh, just uh, disconnect the flow completely for it. So these are, tend to be leak-proof when they are closed. Uh, you can get, get some leaks in, in the ball puppet valves uh, and also in the disc puppets. I've heard about leaks happening there. You do get leaks in the seat valves also, but that's when they are very worn. Uh, and they are usually, as it says here, they are highly precision machining when they create them, so they are, they are usually very good uh, when it comes to leaks. And you only have three-way flow possible. Uh, so that flow can either go this way, that way, or this way. So you, you, don't, you don't have more control options than that. If you want to be able to send flow in a fourth or fifth or sixth direction, you're going to have to connect these in a series so that you get enough uh, function. And that makes, uh, makes for a pretty complicated uh, design if you're start, uh, starting to put many valves together in order to perform one function. 
and they have negative overlapping, as you can see here. They, they, are, they extend uh, past the control edge. Then we're going to look at slide valves. So there are two ways that they, these work. They either rotate, so that they just stay in one spot and you rotate them. And then the piston turns in the cylindrical hole and they can usually be quite a lot shorter than, than uh, the ones that you uh, push and pull along the axis. These work a bit like this. If we have flow coming in here, it stops, it's hitting the, uh, the piston, so it's, it's not getting anywhere. But then if we rotate the piston, we get the possibility of having flow going through here instead. So because now we've just rotated the piston over this way. So it's a very, very uh, simple design of doing it. Yeah? Yeah? Explain it once more. Or yeah? Uh, you're getting flow in from this side, and then this is the part that you can rotate. So when you rotate it around this way, then you can connect these two parts. So in the first one, we can have a flow going through here, for an example, and then we can switch it around to have the flow go this way instead. So, so you, uh, you have quite a lot of possibilities, and it doesn't necessarily need to be just these two options uh, between. You can, you can have uh, many ports uh, on this one in order to, to design, decide which way the flow is going to go. Then you have the longitudinal slide valves. So they go along the axis of the piston. <clears throat> so you move it back and forth, uh, basically. And th there is basically not a maximum amount of uh, connection points to this one. So you can make it do practically anything uh, that you want just by connecting enough stuff and being able to, to uh, create a complex enough piston that allows the flow to go exactly where it needs to go. So then we only have frictional and spring forces to overcome when, when operating these, because usually they do have some sort of a spring uh, attached to them so that when you're operating them, you're basically pushing against the spring, and then if you just let go, it's going to pop back into the original position. So like this one, we have a spring in this end, and we are putting uh, actuation force, force on this side just to push it over to keeping everything closed here. So we're getting pressure from the pump in here. And since uh, we have the same area on both sides of the piston, it's not going to be moved anyway uh, by, by the pressure. So it just equalizes itself. So, so the, the pressure is putting the same amount of force on, on each side. And then these two channels will go to the component. For an example, a cylinder. Uh, that we are going to, to use. So if we get flow through this component, it's going to extend the cylinder, and then we are going to get return along this one. And if we put our pressure through this uh, one, we are going to retract the cylinder, and we are going to get the return flow through here. So both of these out on the sides, they go, go back to the tank. And we add we put on our actuating force when we want, want this one to, uh, to uh, do something. And then we have the spring force counteracting the actuating force. And this is usually how a symbol would look like for one of these. Uh, in this case, it is uh, controlled by uh, a pilot, uh, pilot pressure. So we have a small channel of pressure coming to this side. So instead of actually applying force ourselves through either through manually with our hands or, or uh, some sort of electrical or handle or anything like that. We are instead just applying force to one side through a small channel here. And if that pressure that uh, is reaching that side becomes great enough, it's going to overcome the spring force on the other side and then it's going to open up the valve. And then it's going to return directly to the tank or, a, uh, or in this case, it's going to, to stop the flow from the pump, basically. So it's 
<clears throat> that's one of the, the main designs for, for the pressure relief valves, so that when the pressure gets to a certain point, uh, this pilot pressure overcomes the spring force, and then it's going to uh, hit in and release some of the pressure to the tank instead. And here we have a larger one where we have a, a one of the handles that are manually operated. So it's, it's just a basic symbol to show that this is something where we actually move a handle in order to operate it. And it has quite a lot of different functions, as you can see. So it has three ports on each side and quite a lot of different stuff happening in the different positions of the piston. <coughs> we'll be looking more into detail uh, on this symbol uh, later on. So the slide valves, they need to have a certain amount of, of uh, backlash, as it's called, basically continuous leakage oil. And that has to do with with the fact that uh, we need this uh, film of fluid around the piston. So in order to have room for the fil film of fluid, in order to reduce friction, it means that a little bit of the fluid is always going to be escaping from the, from the pressure side of the piston and over to, to the uh, return side of the piston. So on both sides in this case, we will have something going over here and we will have something going over here. But it's not... It's not a huge flow, so, so it's not uh, something that you... It's not, it's not a big problem, basically, when, when you're uh, doing it. <coughs> so we need this leakage oil, of course. Um, so we do get a slight amount of volumetric flow loss. So if you have a pretty large system with quite a lot of valves in it, then you might possibly have to start thinking about this, because if you get a slight loss at each valve, then you're going to start to get quite a lot in total. So, so we have to look at uh, having enough flow rate to, to cover the components and their, their needs, so that you're not losing uh, too much uh, of the valves. And it is usually that the spring chamber, uh, the chamber where the, the spring is, is uh, connected to a leakage oil line. So in, in case it doesn't leak directly, to, to the tank side of the piston, it leaks uh, into the into the piston area, uh, into the spring chamber, so that it goes directly to the tank there also. Just like on on, on the hydraulic motor, where it also enters into <coughs> enter into I its own chamber and, and leaks back to the tank. And here it is quite a problem with uh, contamination because because if you do get contamination particles in between the piston and the valve housing, then you are going to start scratching it up and you are going to create uh, basically better flow rate for the leakage. So, so you're going to get more and more leaks. Uh, so usually the slide valves have, have larger restrictions when it comes, to, uh, comes to filtering. So it needs better filtering if you have slide valves. So we're going to just... Um, Compare poppet valves and slide valves a little bit. So poppet valves, usually they're leak-proof when they're sealing. They are uh, basically worn out if they start leaking, so you have to re replace them. Slide valves, they have to have some leakage in order to function properly. The poppet valves are very insensitive to contamination. It's uh, not really a problem. And the slide valves are sensitive to contamination, so they need better filtering. But for the poppet valves, if you're going to design uh, multi-positions like the ones, uh, the slide valve, we saw the symbol, there was quite a lot. We had six ports coming into it, uh, three ports coming in, two por uh, three ports going out, uh, several different positions uh, to put it in. Uh, a design like that, that's going to be very complex to do by using uh, poppet valves. You're going to need quite a lot of valves and put them together in a, uh, in a series. With a slide valve, it's pretty simple. You can do very much with it, just one valve housing and one piston uh, to move back and forth. With the poppet valves, you should have equalization of pressure, so you should have this piloting function so that you, you get some pressure to the uh, backside of the, of the piston in order to avoid having too high of an actua actuating uh, pressure, of course. With the slide valves, you get the equalized pressure because you are just 
you're, you're doing it not against the flow, but you're doing it across the flow. So it's much easier to, to move it. You need a lot less uh, force. With the puppet valves, you have very short strokes lengths in order to open and close, so, so you don't really need much motion. And with the slide valves, you usually need a lot more motion, so, so you, you have uh, longer strokes for them, which isn't, I haven't put them as red or green here because it, it's not really a uh, positive or negative either way. It's just something we have to keep in mind when we are designing the systems, that a slide valve usually takes more place, uh, uh, more space than, than a, a puppet valve does. <coughs> so then we actually managed to do everything on this one. That was good. Then we won't fall more behind <laughs> in this. Um, I've almost managed to, uh, to, to regain what we lost with Runal doing one extra lecture before I started doing my stuff. So I've almost managed to, uh, to regain that. So it would be nice to, to keep to it. So we looked at the example of how to select a cylinder for the specific task. And we became familiar with uh, hydraulic motors, which is basically if you... <coughs> If you uh, are a bit rusty already on the, uh, on the different pumps, just go back to that lecture and look at the, uh, the different animations that I showed there because it's the exact same principles for, for the motors. So you would get everything uh, uh, from the pump section that we did. And we've looked at how we, uh, how we determine uh, what motor we are going to need and what pressures and uh, flow rates it's, uh, we have to deliver to the motor in order to get, get the uh, desired characteristic values for our system. Uh, and we've looked at actuating force, figuring out how, how that works. We've become familiar with uh, different design principles for the valves, the, both the sliding valve and the puppet valve. And we've looked more into detail how the puppet valves work and how the slide valve works. And then we'll uh, continue on with valves next week. So we have a couple of references there. Have a good weekend, everyone. <laughs>